Hi, everybody. Happy Earth Day, and welcome to the PyTorch webinar, Using PyTorch to Help Predict Wildfires. I am so glad to have you with us today. My name is Susan Kaler, and I'm on the AI product marketing team at Intel. Now, in this webinar, we are going to walk through how to perform image analysis to predict potential forest fire likelihoods based on the regions of known forest fires acquired via the data set MODIS. Now, MODIS stands for Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer Data Set. We're going to use the Intel extension for PyTorch, powered by one API, to optimize and accelerate PyTorch-based model fine-tuning. Now, the pre-trained ResNet model has been adapted to aerial photos. We're also going to show you how to use synthesized data that is generated using stable diffusion. Now, this is the last in the series of three webinars hosted by PyTorch and Intel that are oriented around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Today's focus is on goal number 15, life on land. As we go through the webinar, please type your questions in the chat. And when we finish up with the webinar, feel free to go ahead and share your feedback also in the chat section. Our presenters today are Bob Cheeseboro and Rahul Nair. Bob's industry experience is in software development and AI solution engineering for Fortune 100 companies and national laboratories, and has been doing that for over three decades. He's also a hobbyist who has logged over 800 miles and 1,000 hours in the field finding dinosaur bones. And you may remember that Bob actually delivered our first webinar on hunting dinosaur bones. He and his sons discovered an important fossil of the only known crocodilian bone from the Jurassic period in New Mexico. They've also discovered and logged over 2,000 bones and described a new bass mass bone med in New Mexico. Now Rahul, in his current role for the Liftoff program for startups, brings his extensive experience in applied AI and engineering to mentor early stage AI startups. His dedication lies in helping these startups transform their innovative ideas into fully fledged market ready products with a strong emphasis on use case driven practical engineering and optimization. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Bob. Thank you, Susan. I'll go ahead and present uh, slides here, see if we can get this uh, rolling. Just a check, you can see my slide, my title slide. So this is, uh, we're gonna be talking about using uh, PyTorch to predict wildfires. Uh, I'm not a forestry person. I have no background in forestry. I have no background in predicting fires per se, but I have quite a background in AI and, and doing vision analysis and doing uh, uh, classification and, and object detection and so forth on, on images. Um, this is the agenda that I'm proposing for today. We're going to be discussing the uh, just uh, this intro to the topic of forestry and for fire prediction, forest fire prediction. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how what you can do if you wanted to uh, get set up. You know, what we've got a, a free um, web uh, location. You can go and have a sandbox that has some very powerful hardware that you could actually try this stuff out. I'll provide your GitHub link so you can actually try the code. And then we'll be just talking about some of the uh, conceptual processes. What's this life cycle of doing this uh, forest fire prediction, including getting the data, labeling it, and doing so forth, doing the training and so forth. Uh, just so you know, we're going to be talking about something called fine-tuning. I'll define that a little bit later, but uh, we're going to be fine-tuning a model with PyTorch on Resna 18. It's a very simple uh, image classification model. And then uh, I'll be telling you about how we can access the Intel GPUs on our server. And to do that, we need uh, an, an Intel extension for PyTorch uh, to be able to express and communicate with that GPU. And then uh, additionally, I want to show you how we use synthetic data while we waited for the uh, permissions and the, the funding to go through from our team to the various uh, providers of data. So we were waiting uh, a wait period to get the data and be able to use it. So we use stable diffusion to get our, our um, 
models and our pipeline and get our, our all of our code running in anticipation when we finally get the real data. So we'll be telling you how we did that. And then uh, we use stable diffusion uh, with that um, GPU as well using the Intel extension for PyTorch. So we'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, just to talk a little bit of background of the forest fires. So I know today is Earth Day. If you remember, there's uh, even, uh, I think it was last year, there was a devastating fire in Hawaii. Um, a lot of people have been impacted, uh, lost their lives, lost, lost loved ones in both the um, fires in California over the last um, decade, a uh, few years, Hawaii, various places throughout the world. It's a very serious topic. Um, so I, I want us all to kind of be thinking, you know, with a proper degree of, of uh, uh, sobriety, you know, when we're, when we're discussing this. And so I will be talking about technical details of image analysis and, and different things, but um, really this is um, uh, something that, that we need to pay due um, homage to those, those people. So uh, in terms of loss of human lives uh, and damage to ecosystems and wildlife, uh, this has been a, 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 an enormous uh, period that we're living in. You know, according to uh, Dr. Noel, um, Myers, uh, he had a quote, this was back, you know, even in uh, 2020, I think it was, that he said that just as a prediction that the total damage and cumulative economic loss for the 2021 wildfire season then was expected to be between 70 billion and 90 billion dollars in the U.S. and 45 to 55 billion of those damages would occur in California alone. So, uh, what can we do as community members and programmers and AI folks? What could we do to throw our hat in the ring to help push a technology that may be able to solve this? So early identification of fire likelihoods is, um, in my view, key. You know, so it gives you time for remediation steps. So uh, with that, I just wanted to kind of show you just a little bit of a image of an impact i didn't drill in too deeply because it it, it can be a, a bit disturbing but this is just from the paradise fire uh image on the left is from before the 2018 fire in, in paradise california um, and th those neighborhoods were lush green you know trees all over and um then after the fire in 2018 the aerial photo aerial photos and particularly when you zoom in um you know it's just many of those houses, vast stretches of them were reduced to just foundations and and it was uh, just devastating. And so this is just zooming back out, uh, you know, kind of showing the, the degree of loss and even the change in the foliage patterns and so forth as a result of that fire. So uh, if you wanted to play along, this is not a, a workshop per se, but if you, you know, we'll be recording this uh, session. Uh, the slides are, will be available. The um, uh, data sets and the code is available. You can get on our, our free access to our Intel developer cloud to try all this PyTorch code out yourself. So uh, I just wanted to give a, a nod there that if at some point you want to play along, you know, do this over the weekend or do sometime when you're free, uh, you could play this and you could actually try your hand at improving the models, trying different regions and seeing if in your estimation, if this technique holds water. Okay. So in uh, predict, uh, predicting forest fires um, all comes down to the data. And uh, one of the things I just, I did wanna say is that using aerial photos is interesting to be able to predict forest fires. But uh, when you use the word prediction, you're uh, automatically introducing a temporal component. There's a component of time here. So when you're gonna get the data, uh, one of the things that you need to do is find a data source where you can filter on time as well as location. And so I've listed uh, a number of just possible sources for the data for you to grab. I've experimented personally with the Google Earth I Engine and also with the Earth Explorer from USGS, US Geological Survey. And the data sets that I've used most recently are the free ones from the uh, Earth Explorer. But uh, the ones I like better was when we anted up and paid money as a corporation to uh, access the Google Earth Engine uh, technique. I, I like their images better, but uh, you can get the ones for free. And so our, our, when we did the workshop, we, we did it really with the uh, free USGS uh, images. And then, uh, you know, here's just a snippet from the uh, JavaScript code 
uh, that I used in, in Google Earth Editor to uh, grab the data. And so um, this was uh, the, the uh, NIOP data is basically the um, uh, agricultural data set that shows um, regions of forest and farmland and so forth. And so with, with this one, you can specify a date range to grab images and you can specify a location. Then a, the location you can specify uh, very precisely and you can grab images from that area. But the uh, collection of the, the aerial photos are from whenever they had the appropriate plane flights. And at some time, those plane flights may have had cloud cover or whatever. So they may um, uh, do cloud removal. They may take several different flights to get the, the correct coverage and then do a mosaic. So, so uh, uh, this is the, the, the problem with getting the data. The, the better that you can get a really good temporal resolution of your data, the better your model would be. Nevertheless, this is what I did, and I had good results in being able to predict uh, these fires in, in, in California, and I'm going to talk about that. So uh, as uh, Susan mentioned, uh, we started by using the MODIS data set, and uh, this is key. The MODIS data set is a very cool data set. Uh, I think it comes from um, uh, NOAA, the National Organization uh, Atmosphere and, and whatever, you know, NOAA. And, uh, uh, so you can grab this data set. Now, this data set spans more than just the United States. It's a, gl a global burn area data set, the one that we're uh, grabbing here. And so I focused it down to uh, the regions kind of centered around Chico, California, zoomed in to about the level that you see here on the map, and then I specified uh, a time range. And so what I wanted to look at was that known fire t time span from 2018 to about 2020, three years worth of, of burn area. And I just wanted to see the extent to which uh, burns have occurred. And that's what you see there in those regions that are, are red. And so then the idea is that we want to go and sample, randomly sample uh, locations within those burn areas. And then from those locations, we can then grab aerial photos for each location. And so what we would want to do is have enough um, samples that we have non-burn areas that we know in the future, you know, look at it, say from 2016 to 2017, we would take areas that have not yet been burned, but that from the MODIS data, so we know would be burned in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe. And so then what we can do is we can go back to the 2016 and 17 uh, time range grab images from before the burn uh, occurred from all over this region, just randomly sampling it. And then we can use this MODIS data set effectively to label where we know burns would then later occur. And so this is um, just human random sampling, so it's not truly random. I, I was just doing this. This is the slides here was when I was just doing my very first experiments with it. So I just went in and, and in the Google Earth uh, engine, I just uh, put waypoints down where within wherever the boundaries were for the MODIS data set. And so you'll see that the orange ones that I sampled there would be sampling burn regions, obviously, those little orange pins. And on the right side, the blue pins were where I was sampling non-burn areas all around where the burn areas were. Now, subsequently, in the notebooks that I provided on GitHub, we do a, a more true random sampling of these things. So it's not human random sampling, but I... I, I uh, express those boundaries, and then we do a random sampling uh, all throughout. But this is just to give you a picture, an idea of what you do. You sample in those burn areas, and you sample in the non-burn areas. And now those samples are basically just a GPS location. But then what I can do is go back and grab the images for each of those locations. And I know in the future, you know, let's say from the 2016-17 standpoint, future meaning 2018 to 2020, I know what areas were going to be burned, okay? And so then what we can do is we can use the um, uh, PyTorch and the, use the uh, Torch Vision uh, libraries to um, use, say, ResNet 18 as a model to uh, predict and to, to basically classify. So I'm going to have two classes. I'm going to have burn and no burn, or I think in the latest rendition, I said fire and no fire, okay? And so um, it's a binary classifier, so it's very simple. So we can get by with using ResNet 18. 
And uh, ResNet is just one of those um, uh, sort of famous models that was um, uh, created several years ago, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, that um, did very well at, at doing classification of data. And it's this is one of the smaller models. Uh, it has only 18 layers. And so, it, but it worked fine. And so one of the things that um, uh, our code does here is that we use something called fine tuning. Really what fine tuning is, is that you, you, you take this model that has 18 layers in it and uh, the pre-trained version that you would download from, uh, say even from the Torch Vision, if you look at that uh, um, uh, tutorial that they have, uh, when you download that, you would be downloading a pre-trained version of ResNet that was pre-trained on the ImageNet data sets. So it has images of pedestrians and cats and apples and whatever in it, but it has nowhere in it does it have an aerial photo anywhere in that uh, data set that you trained the original pre-trained ResNet model. And so what you can do, though, is you, you can do what's called fine-tuning, where we, we freeze, we lock down all those early layers uh, so we don't, we're not going to be propagating uh, gradients or anything back through those uh, lower layers. We're just going to train maybe the last two layers uh, to fine tune it for aerial photos specific to our problem. And th so that's the, the fire, no fire data, uh, image data. And so we, we can do this both on the CPU or on the, on the, what we call the XPU. XPU is our uh, Intel 1100 series data center GPUs. And so uh, this is r really fast. It just takes a few minutes uh, to fine tune our model uh, on those GPUs. And they're very powerful GPUs. We call that an XPU uh, on ours. Intel has many different kinds of accelerators. And so our nomenclature tends to be XPU. So uh, the title got messed up on this slide a little bit. I apologize for that. But uh, the, the, what I wanted to do here, our goal was to use the 1100 series uh, data center GPU on the Intel developer cloud. So uh, what I wanted to do is introduce, and the title says, uh, though you can't see it here, this is an introduction to the Intel extension for PyTorch. And this is uh, just some of the information about the Intel extension for PyTorch that um, uh, are, are key. So uh, think of it as sort of a wrapper or a namespace around uh, PyTorch that just makes uh, that namespace now is aware of the term XPU, for example, and it has a few extra methods to optimize uh, for the XPU or even optimize for the Xeon uh, CPUs itself also. So uh, Intel worked very closely with PyTorch.org to um, upstream these technologies that we create for accessing our hardware and upstream them to the mainline version of PyTorch, and that's our goal. And so many of the things that uh, even listed here uh, are now now in the upstream version. But there usually remains, like I think the XPU is still one of those ones that we we um, use our Intel extension for, for PyTorch to express and to be able to control those, those GPUs. But a lot of these uh, technologies for using uh, the uh, VNNI instructions and AMX instructions, we, we're constantly working with PyTorch.org to, to push those uh, back into the main, main line of PyTorch. And that's our goal. So this is just a little cheat sheet. So uh, if you're familiar with using PyTorch, I assume everybody is, uh, you know, we're here on the PyTorch.org, you know, uh, discussion. Uh, then, you know, however you do Torch Vision models, however you do ResNet, you just do it exactly the same way. Uh, there's really no difference other than what I've highlighted or I've circled here in blue. In order to use our, uh, uh, on a CPU, in order to do inference against uh, these models uh, with an extra degree of optimization, you would add these two lines that I've circled here. We would import IPEX, which is our Intel extension for PyTorch, and then we just say, hey, take the original model that we have and just optimize it. Uh, you know, you just call IPEX optimize, give it a model, and now we have a new optimized model that may do do things like reordering the the uh, order of channels, uh, you know, color channels and different things to, to really get an optimum performance. Uh, and then uh, on this XPU side, when we're touching the 1100 series uh, GPUs from Intel, then it would be these four lines on the right. And this is how we would do inference on what, XPU GPU for, from Intel. Uh, so you would just uh, convert your model to be a, 
XPU aware. You would convert your data to be XPU aware, and then you call this optimized set, uh, step. So these are the only uh, big things that you have to do to your code. It's, it's really not that much uh, to be able to then communicate from PyTorch through our uh, GPUs, our 1100 series GPUs. So let me uh, just talk about fine tuning just a little bit. You know, fine tuning is really where you're going to retrain just the last few layers uh, of your model. So on the left, we have uh, sort of the pre-trained um, uh, version, maybe from from um, uh, image or from PyTorch. Uh, you know, the ResNet 18 model that we may download. And um, originally, the ResNet 18 model had just all random numbers in it. And somebody who took the, the step to go through the ImageNet data set with thousands of images, and they pre-trained, they trained this thing, even from random numbers, all the weights and biases in every layer were originally random. And then somebody said, well, let's train it on the ImageNet data set. And so they trained thousands and thousands of images. It took probably, I don't know how, hours and days probably to do that back in the day. And so they um, created what we call a pre-trained model. So now those pre-trained models, all the weights and biases in every layer have um, values that when you feed it an image of a cat or a dog or a pedestrian or a giraffe, it knows what those things are. It's able to classify those because it's been pre-trained on a wide variety of images. But those images didn't include anything like an aerial photo, okay? So um, I don't want to train it from scratch. I don't want to have to go back and spend hours and days, you know, um, maybe reclassifying it and training a model from scratch all the way from random numbers up to a, a current model. Because I've learned that, and many of you have learned too, that if we use transfer learning, or sometimes we call, refer to this as fine tuning a model, uh, we can take a pre-trained model, like that one that was already pre-trained with, with uh, ImageNet, and then we can just, freeze all those bottom layers. In other words, by freezing, I mean, we're not going to um, allow the, the gradients to back propagate. We're not going to update any of those values for the, the majority of the layers. It's just the very last layer, the output layer, and maybe one layer prior to that, that we would unfreeze and allow us to train those weights and biases by allowing the, the gradients to be back propagated and allowing those view values for those last two layers to be updated. And so by that, when we're feeding it these um, aerial photo images, we're training a model, just fine tuning it, and it doesn't take very much time to do uh, against a data set that I care about. And so you could do the same thing. You can take a pre-trained ImageNet model and train it against a, a widely disparate uh, character characterization or character of an image than anything that was previously even in ImageNet. And when you think of how an aerial photo might look different from a, an image of a person or a cat or a dog or a bicycle, you can see that that uh, uh, maybe even for your application, uh, hey, I don't have images anything like what's in ImageNet. Well, neither did I, and neither did we when we did this ImageNet, uh, when we did these aerial photos. And yet by just doing fine tuning on the last two layers, we had success. So at a high level, uh, the one thing that we need I need you to be aware of is that if you're going to uh, use our uh, GPUs on our Intel Developer Cloud, for example, uh, for free, uh, what you could do is uh, just make sure that your Torch version, your PyTorch version, is um, high-level uh, dot compatible, you know, the same version level as our Intel extension for PyTorch version. So they they're like uh, twins. So you you know keep the version numbers roughly the same. You'll see that in the very fine tuned part of the numbers they, they deviate a little bit but i've highlighted in green the parts that you really want to pay attention and make sure they're the same model and then it's just a simple matter of doing the import for the ipex and then uh, what we do in, in a uh, uh, object-oriented sense uh, we, we take the uh, uh, we create a method called to ipex where we do these uh, conversions uh, to, for the model and the uh, call the optimizer to um, in, in this case, we're, we're, we're taking the model and we're, we're uh, putting the channels last as just an optimization that we're doing. And then we, we uh, call that optimized step. So we take a, a, the original ResNet model of the, the pre-trained version, and then we uh, pass it to the optimizer step of the IPEX. And so it's, it's fairly simple. And it's, it's basically reflective of what the simple cheat sheet that I showed you before. And then um, 
really from there, uh, you know, it's just a matter of doing the, the, the train pretty much as you would notice that we are saying, look, if, if Intel extension for PyTorch is involved, if it's imported, we, we've got it available, go ahead and call this function that says to IPEX and this will automatically convert your, your version over. Uh, Rahul, am I missing anything? Is there anything you want to add color wise to this or? Basically what, what you mentioned. So just, just remember that, um, we upstream almost all contributions to PyTorch mainstream, like uh, Bob just suggested. Uh, there's around 90 to 99 percentage of optimizations for Intel is already in the PyTorch mainstream. And um, what we provide with Intel extensions of PyTorch is that first the support for um, Intel accelerators, specifically our GPUs today. Um, so if you uh, want to use Intel GPUs, you would use um, Intel extensions with PyTorch, and it will add a new uh, namespace um, into uh, PyTorch because then you can use PyTorch.xpu. Um, the other thing is that uh, we do have some specific optimizations for models that might not be generally applicable. Um, those uh, elements also we add to uh, Intel extensions of PyTorch for now. Eventually, this would be in the main line also. So if you want to get best of both worlds, uh, the PyTorch and uh, specific optimizations that might be there in uh, IPEX, that is Intel extensions of PyTorch, um, import it and just call the, uh, like you could see here in the two IPEX fun function, um, uh, call the optimizer, uh, IPEX.optimize, pass in the model, and optimizer if you're training the model. Uh, if you're just doing inference, just pass in the model. So that's just one line change. It would be model equal to uh, IPEX.optimize model and the data type you want. That's basically it. And then I'm seeing that there was a question about the, the size of the images that we used. I, I answered it. So we, okay. we use uniform sizes, uh, 512 by 512. Uh, the one thing could be an improvement, right? Um, for um, for the, an extra thing that you could try out with PyTorch. Um, it is really, it, it is challenging to do distribution to make, essentially match the distribution of the real data and synthetic data, uh, especially if that data is not part of the training set. Um, so if you want an, um, uh, to generate some image that was not originally used um, in the, um, you know, for, forest fire, for example, I don't know how many of forest fires were used for stable diffusion um, data. So sometimes it could be challenging with the distribution changes. If the distribution changes, your model of fitting would be uh, problematic. So there is still work going on on making sure uh, customizing stable diffusion. So not only from a visual representation, these images are same, but in a, a probability wise also, um, in whatever image you generate has the same probability distribution as the real image. So this could be something you could work on uh, to create maybe a tiny PyTorch based library um, uh, for synthetic data generation. Um, a lot yeah. of people would love that. Well, and two with the real data, I know when I was downloading the USGS uh, images, they tend to be fairly large swaths. And so I would, um, but I've specified kind of a zoom level. So, you know, kind of a, an altitude effectively. And that turns out to be fairly key. Like you want to get that somewhere near where I, I put mine uh, in terms of that zoom level when you're grabbing those images. But uh, uh, then what happens is you have a map that's you know really big and so i would go in and i would uh i wrote just a simple little utility to cut out these you know 512 by 512 i tried different sizes and really the size that i chose didn't matter that much um surprisingly but it, you just need to be consistent so you know you need to be uniform in, in cutting out those images and then there, uh, there is another question on how many days or weeks were you able to predict forest fires? I think we will go into that detail uh, yeah. uh, on some of those things. Yeah, um, yeah that's that's yeah, another. And the last thing is that... going out about uh, two to three years. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm going to talk about some caveats. I'm going to talk about it at the very end. Um, there's uh, there are folks that say, oh, this can't possibly work. And so I will address some of those those challenges. And bear in mind, I'm not a forestry guy, and neither is Rahul. And we're, we're neither one. We've never won. Either one of us done um, forest fire gear and gone out and, and fought forest fires. Uh, and we don't predict them for a living. But what we do is we're experimenting with uh, very powerful uh, 
classification techniques, pattern matching, pattern finders. And when you apply these pattern finders to aerial photos, we're finding some very interesting and intriguing results. So really what my challenge to you all is, you guys go play and maybe some of you bring expertise to this subject that um, you could improve it. And um, so that's kind of the challenge there for you guys. This right? is That's incredibly important, Bob, um, especially with PyTorch and all the community around it is Domain experts can now really easily build uh, solutions where we leverage machine learning to solve problems. So we uh, we do have internal experts who have uh, expertise in forestry, and we did show some of this code and data generated to them. They were really surprised. But what what I would love is for the community to go and create a solid solution for open science. Um, it could be forest fire prediction. There are many challenges where uh, we are data poor, uh, especially in making sure that probability matches. So this would be a big contribution to the community as a whole. Uh, if you create a really fast PyTorch based diffusion model uh, for solving forest fire issues, uh, water scarcity issues, um, even in astrophysics, there are uh, uh, use cases for this. Um, so we, yeah. yeah, I would like to see uh, you develop a solution like that and maybe invite us to watch your workshop. Yes, and if you attended my first workshop on predicting fire, I mean, predicting dinosaur bones, this is almost the exact same model. Uh, it's using different image sizes, it's using different um, aerial photos with different classifications that we've labeled differently. But uh, the, the technique is very powerful and portable across domains. But again, we're, we're limited to the data that we that we get. Yeah, and I'll be talking about that somewhat at the end. But uh, awesome. There, so Pat, Patrick mentioned that um, um, he um, they did a uh, similar uh, competition and one in uh, they uh, worked on similar thing for forest fire prediction, won a national competition. So we would like we'd love to learn more about that. And you know, if there are any details you could share, GitHub repo or anything that you worked on on that, uh, that would be awesome for the community. Yes, uh, and if we could collaborate it. maybe on a, on a way to yeah. further this, you know, that would be really cool too, uh, Patrick. So uh, this is just some of the results. So um, I'm showing both the uh, loss curves and the accuracy curves that I generated. Now this only took, once we got the GPUs cooking on this thing, and we, we uh, Rahul did a good job of, of doing a fast API a sort of approach to uh, doing learning rate finder. Uh, you find a really good learning rate to use uh, for this ResNet 18 model. And so once we did that, you know, within probably six or eight um, uh, iterations through the training loop, uh, this was converging incredibly fast. And so we, we were getting these um, uh, accuracies uh, approaching that 90% level. Now, subsequently, uh, in what we did when I started really randomizing and collecting a little bit more data, we got north of the 90% uh, mark for, for accuracy. But this was one of the preliminary ones. And you can see with the confusion matrix that, you know, the, the main diagonals were were, were um, uh, high and the off diagonals were low. So, you know, this was just our very first preliminary model. Uh, but uh, the subsequent ones, the ones that I've posted to the GitHub, uh, they've improved, you know, quite a bit. But I had this slide from from uh, our one of our earlier discussions, our earlier presentations, and so I kept this one. But but uh, it even from the very inception, from the very beginning, we were seeing uh, large amounts of success with predicting the accuracy of this thing. And so um, I did want to just say something about the stable diffusion thing. Um, Turns out that when we were doing this, I grabbed those images from uh, USGS. I grabbed some images uh, just as an individual from Google Earth Engine. And then when, in talking to our legal team, they said, well, you, as an individual, you can grab those. You, they say you can use those as an individual. You can use those images for free or whatever. But since I'm a member of a corporation, um, I can't use those for free. I have to pay for it. And so I, I had to talk to our legal team. We had to talk to our finance team. And so in that whole bureaucratic uh, thing that you have to go through, it took time <laughs> to g officially get the data, <laughs> to officially be able to use the data. And so one of the things that Rahul and I uh, talked about was, could we use stable diffusion in the meantime? Let's create the model. Let's, let's put all the software, do all the things, all the image slicing, getting the uniform sizes, all that pre and post processing stuff done, get a training loop kind of going. 
on synthesized data. And so uh, we use stable diffusion to generate um, aerial photo-like images. And then what I did is I sweetened it a little bit because obviously uh, stable diffusion uh, aerial photos don't exist anywhere on the planet. Okay, so they're not going to be predictive of any kind of a fire or any kind of a thing. But I just wanted to generate some images that would be aerial photo-like, but this set predict a different class than this set, okay, just to get our whole training pipeline, get everything ready to go. And so... Yeah, and yeah, one thing there, what uh, Bob was mentioning, so um, it's especially important what data you use to train your model or, or create, and there are... Um, a lot of concerns about data, how it's being used. Uh, so we go through stringent process on making sure the data is legally, um, you know, we get legal permission. Uh, if there's finance involved, all those things are done, um, you know, clearly. And it's it's incredibly important for us as a community, as a company, and, and as individuals. So this is one way to, while that process takes its time to get the data, how to accelerate through an engineering approach where you could bootstrap and try out some of these approaches. So you don't you don't start building your model once you get the real data, but you could start building the model while you're um, trying to get the real data and really see if this would work. So that's where it really helped us, me and Bob, like the, we just tried it and we had to tweak some things to make sure the probability distribution uh, aligns, but just uh, accelerated maybe a few weeks uh, yeah. for us. Yeah, so we were actually making, real progress while we're waiting for the approval to use real data. And so uh, what I did is I took these synthetic data images that look like aerial photos, but they don't exist on the planet. I sweetened them by coloring this. These just uh, show you over here, just sweeten these by these are just slightly 2% browner, you know, a, a little bit redder, a little less green. And these were a little bit greener, 2% greener, a little bit less red. And so uh, for our stable diffusion ones, our synthetic data, while we're waiting for real data, right, to just get our all the other software ready to go, um, we did that. And that worked out actually extremely well uh, also. So I thought I'd throw that out there as, as a, uh, something for you to do uh, so that when you're waiting to get your data approvals, you, you're, you're not just waiting and, and uh, making PowerPoint yeah. slides. And there was, there was a question on, could you provide a sample text prompt to generate synthesized data? Yeah, we would definitely provide the sample text and also the code on what we used to do. There are some code that uh, we use to um, sort of understand the distribution pattern. We essentially use TSNI and some principal component analysis to plot uh, and visually understand, you know, if this data is in uh, the same distribution. But that's like generic code you could easily do once you create the synthetic images. That particular code, we are uh, we don't have it in the repo, but we have code for generating the images and also the prompts that we use to generate the images. Uh, you'll always would like to tweak it. And we would really like to see that automated approach, even remove that human in the loop or to solve that distribution challenge as well. If, one of you could do that, that would be great. We, we would love to see your PRs to the repo that Bob would be uh, showing on how to improve this, um, you know, please, please go ahead. And yep. and we would like to see interesting ideas. Yep, the, the code for the stable diffusion model uh, has all the prompts that we used and the, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, we tried both image to text and what or, uh, text to image and image to image. We, we settled, I think on image to image, but, um, uh, you know, we've tried both. So all that stuff is kind of in there and then uh, in the GitHub and I'll be sharing the link here directly. Um, so what data are you using in the workshop? Okay, so in this particular case, uh, even though I said there were multiple different sources and I, I even like the Google Earth Engine one better because it had a truer color to my eye, it just looked better. Um, uh, we wound up using the uh, USGS Earth Explorer data and we used about 100 images in total. And then uh, uh, I've just explained what we tried with Stable Diffusion to kind of get our pipeline set up. But once we got the real images, we were using the data from Earth Explorer. And that was uh, some of the results I was, I was showing you uh, earlier with the with the uh, confusion matrix and with our accuracies getting up to about 90. We've since uh, actually pushed that into, I think the last time I ran it was either 94 or 95%. So uh, uh, anyway, so this this is uh, uh, some of the details. If you want a little bit more detail, I, I wrote an article, Predict Forest Fires Using PyTorch. You can click on that hyperlink when you get the slides and go, go look at that. And... Uh, 
you kind of read it more at your leisure so you don't have a temporal uh, video thing that you have to slide back and forth. You can just look at an article. Uh, so just what is stable diffusion? So you know, we should probably talk a little bit about that. So um, Rahul, you, you want to take a spin at a definition sure. of stable diffusion? Or? Sure. sure. The, these are uh, stable diffusion. Generally, it comes from latent diffusion models. So what we essentially do is that we, um, in the text to image, um, we have we start from noise, a Gaussian noise, and we condition that that's what you see in step one. We condition that noise um, using a text um, prompt. So the text prompt would be converted to the same dimension as an image using something like a clip model. If you are familiar with embeddings like clip, CLIP, uh, what we essentially do is that these, these particular models are trained on both images and text. So if you convert that to a bunch of vectors where you pass in a text to a clip model and image to a text and uh, image to a clip model, both of these vectors are in the same space. So you know, okay, uh, give me an image of a dog, an image of a dog. Both of this would be closer to each other than an image of a cat. So uh, essentially the models that we give these vectors will have an understanding of what are related to each other and what are not related to each other. So we use a clip model, get an output from a text prompt to a vector, um, use the Gaussian noise, and we schedule each uh, time gradually improving. Essentially, we are you could think of uh, diffusion models as um, a sculpture creating art, where we chip away things that's not really needed and get the actual image. We don't add, uh, add things, we essentially remove things slowly. Uh, when it comes to image to image, um, instead of Gaussian noise, it would be an image. And we'll start with one image, uh, use the text prompt, convert to a uh, clip embedding, and we schedule maybe 50 or 60 steps. There are, there are stable diffusion model, uh, there are diffusion models. Stable diffusion is only one kind of uh, diffusion models that you could use to maybe in 10 steps or 20 steps, even in one step, create an image uh, that matches very well with your text. Uh, that's a high level idea. There are many articles detailing how it how it works. We are not going to specifically into detail of stable diffusion. If anyone wants the details, let us know. We can add uh, relevant links. Yep. And I see the time we're starting to run a little late, so I'm going to kind of go through. Yep. Stable diffusion wasn't really the the central thrust we we're doing. We just thought it was like an interesting bone to throw you guys if if you're waiting for your data. Um, so I'm going to go past some of these and start talking about the uh, optimizations. So um, I mentioned something about how to do the, uh, opt in general, how to use the Intel extension for PyTorch with the GPU. Specifically, what we did in the stable diffusion uh, code was basically these four steps. And I'm going to keep going through because we spent a bit of time. Uh, just with respect to the synthetic data, this is uh, basically, and it gives you an overview of what you do. Uh, in synthetic land, there is no modus data set. Uh, there, the images don't really exist on the planet. So when you're synthesizing your data, uh, you create a random sampling and you you look within a boundary. And this is a good explanation of what, what I did with the modus as well, but this is for the synthetic data. Um, uh, you, you can sprinkle the, the data around randomly and then you can uh, count which ones are within the boundary, which ones are not. You can you know, sample those images that you've generated here and the ones that would be generated in the star pattern here, I would have salted to be slightly browner, like I described. And the ones out here would have been slightly greener, uh, just by 2% or so. And then uh, we're getting similar accuracy curves from doing this on just the synthetic data. Uh, now going back to the results from the real data, uh, this is what the ultimate map looked like. So, um, uh, it was actually a very good reproduction here of the the true data. The modus data set you can kind of see still underneath as a as a placement guide. What I did is I, I took every image from every pin, whether they're red or green, and I fed it to our trained model now. Okay, so now I'm just going to score. I'm going to inference with these randomly selected Im images here. And so I take an image. I actually literally grab the real image. This is trained. Uh, this is run against the 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 model that was trained with the real data. Right. And so then we get a score. And so it's basically the score was basically uh, passed through softmax. So it's either going to be class one or class two. So 
the 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 greens were the uh, non-fire regions so what these are the predictions this is what the model predicted it said anything in the coastal range over there on the left no fire danger uh, any of the things north of the coast range and between kind of up in the upper left you know those two firing ranges it said no fire danger here with a couple of exceptions there were a couple of little um pins that it said well maybe that's a fire right there right and so it said that was a fire same thing over by the paradise area and over here in the sierra nevadas over by chico and paradise um almost anything that was truly later on within the the modus uh range it predicted all those things as yeah this looks like a fire to me it looks like fire 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 it mispredicted right here it mispredicted in a few of these spots saying hey i think there's fire here but if you got outside of that region it was predicting yeah there's no fire here at all there's no fire down here so this is just an intriguing result okay it's not definitive proof it's an intriguing result that that's why i want to lay it at your feet and have you guys go and experiment more I did the same thing with some of the fires that we had here in New Mexico. We had one of the largest, for, the largest forest fire in our state history. I think it was last year or the year before. And uh, I was able to do the same kind of thing. I can't use the California model, this model, on my New Mexico data. The foliage types are different. The elevation topography stuff is different. But when I sampled those areas around our Las Vegas uh, fire, or Cal fire, whatever it was, uh, I sampled the areas that were not burned, the areas that were burned uh, from a previous year, right? Previous two years. And then I predicted, okay, here's what the foliage pattern looked like two years before the fire. Now let's train the model in New Mexico. And then I was able to predict of, of the fires here in New Mexico as well. So it's worked in two locations, okay? Um, to about that 90% level. So um, the New Mexico model probably wouldn't work in Colorado, probably wouldn't work in Arizona or California. Same thing, the California model. It's kind of specific to this general north, north, uh, northern California area. But uh, that model um, worked to the degree that I've shown you and, and somewhere on that uh, 90, 95% accuracy level. So th this is uh, some of the stuff. Now I did want to just highlight some of the potential criticisms of the method. I presented this workshop um, um, a few months ago, and somebody in the fire industry, they predict forest fires. They say, oh, this, this can't work. Um, you know, really, uh, what they do, uh, they're in the business, uh, and what they do is that they focus on ignition. They say there's too much uh, variability in foliage. You can't possibly look at, a, at an aerial photo and kind of predict what a forest fire is going to do. There's just too many variables that you look at. And so um, I think to a human looking at those patterns, that's probably true. Um, and I have to take the word for it. They have experience in that area. Their primary focus is on ignition, which means that they look at weather data, which is out to about two weeks. They're predicting essentially lightning strikes, you know, um, thunderstorms. Um, and so that's how they predict. Um, the data sources here uh, that I'm talking about can be unreliable. When you're using the NIOP data, uh, you know, they don't collect that data every single day. You know, so there's, and when they're flying over, there may be cloud cover, there could be smoke cover, there could be whatever there is. Uh, and so they may do a composite. Um, they may collect the data in September in one location and October in another location. Uh, so the foliage differences are, you know, there's different foliage and, and trees that are grow in California versus New Mexico versus Hawaii versus wherever. So these are all known issues. Okay, I get it. I get it. I, I, I agree. Okay. Um, this uh, model appears to key in on the colors and the contrasts. Uh, you know, basically those co contrast patterns are going to be indicative of a topographic range, the the elevation differences between highs and lows, and how frequently that that occurs. And so, uh, you know, maybe in Iowa, uh, this isn't going to work. You know, because uh, what we're doing both in New Mexico and in California, there's you know large uh, elevation gains and losses in a given range. However, all that said, I want you to remember the story of the bumblebee. See, according to the theory of aerodynamics and as may be demonstrated through laboratory tests and, and wind tunnel experiments, the bumblebee is unable to fly. This is because the size, weight, and shape of his body in relation to total wing spread makes flying impossible. But the bumblebee being ignorant of these profound scientific truths goes ahead and flies anyway and manages to make a little honey every day. So which is it? Um, is it, is, are, are we just uh, in the industry? Are we just 
um, we found a way that we can predict out to two weeks and that's all you can do. And there's all these theory reasons why it, it can't work um, for predicting later, you know, two, three years in advance. Or is the bumblebee really flying, right? And so that's what I'd like to leave you guys with is you guys go out and catch us some bumblebees <laughs> and you tell us whether these models are working for you too, okay? So one uh, question, yeah. Bob, uh, yes. Pat Patrick had a question. How many days in the past did you label the picture as fire? Uh, for example, if there was a fire at, on 6-6-2022, did you take the photo of 5-6-2022? Uh, uh, no, I, I, yeah. the, the trouble with the data sets that I'm using, and this is one of the things I kind of alluded to on this on this previous slide on the caveats, when you're using the um, uh, NIOP DQQQ or even the, the, the uh, um, data that comes from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, you, when I'm looking at those agricultural type images, it's... Um, I would I would have to specify a date range, so I can't I can't just say you know give me the image from July sixth you know twenty sixteen or whatever. Uh, there weren't there weren't any flights that day, or the image that they have there was cloudy, or it's just not available. And so you have to give it a range of data. And this is one of the valid criticisms of the thing is that I can't predict right now. I I just can't get the data for every single day to be able to predict with that degree of temporal resolution. So all I can do is go from like a two year period and say, well, grab me some images in there generally, and then grab me some images temporally from somewhere in that two or three year span. And some regions that you would go to, uh, they won't have those aerial photos from a given range. You know, you might specify a six month period and there would be no images. So you have to open that temporal window up. And that is one of the problems, right? And so um, the, one of the things that I did not do was, and as you're saying, like to be very much more precise about the time frame, like what season, what what exact date, what month, right? And maybe even other conditions, you know, where the recent uh, uh, rainstorms, you know, whatever it was. So I did not do that. I just blindly grabbed that time slice from 2016 to 2017, any image that they had from NIOP from that range, and that was the images I trained on. Uh, and then the way I labeled the images was by looking at the, the MODIS data set from years later, 2018 to 2020. And so I would grab those as the labeling mechanism to say, okay, I have these 2016, 17 images, I have a bunch of them, which ones were in the future going to be burns, which ones were not. And so that's the way I did it. And it's, it is a limitation that I, I can't be as precise as what you're articulating. Um, the, so if you want to get started, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, here the instruction for the developer cloud that Bob has given. Um, we do have free, free Jupyter notebooks available here in the standard account. Anyone can create an account there. And each user gets a 48 gig GPU um, and a 112 core CPU with um, half a terabyte of RAM. Um, you could try this same workshop there, or there are many examples of Gen AI using PyTorch uh, there as well. And then I did leave a, a reference here uh, for the code and for my Medium article. So if you want to reproduce what I did, you can go here. And so um, it's this is all in the slides that will be provided for you. The video will be provided. And then I just wanted to leave you with this call to action that um, go try it. You know, be the bumblebee. Go try and you know, just throw caution to the wind, just go see if it works because I got it to work in two different states and maybe that's a fluke or, or maybe there's some merit. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd appreciate it, the broader community going and trying these experiments yourselves. So. This highly educational webinar and wow, it was just so appropriate for Earth Day. Thank you to the PyTorch Foundation for hosting us today. I hope that after watching this webinar that you're inspired to use PyTorch to help solve challenging issues that impact our Earth. Look for the summary blog of all three webinars in this UN Sustainable Development Goals series with PyTorch and Intel AI, which will be available soon on PyTorch.org. Take care and enjoy our beautiful planet. Thank you.